I don't use the competences, actually. I love applied mathematics. It's my passion. I was doing AI neural networks when I was back in university a long time ago, and it was the AI winter. And so there was always this passion about doing fun things, uh, creating new algorithms, stuff like this. So combine the two, and you get a lot of the DNA of InstaDeep, which is doing deep tech innovation, being a leader in AI, but a different kind of leader, a leader actually coming from the developing world and building a bridge to the developed world, which is a concept at the time when we uh, started didn't exist. People did not believe we can do deep tech innovation starting from Africa. People lost at me. So we were talking about like, don't try to ride the wave. Ideally, you create your own wave. That's how you need to think about it. If something is too fashionable, etc., think like uh, crypto 2022 20, until a uh, recent crash, it's probably a bit too late to join the wave from that point of view. When things get completely you know, out of fashion, etc., or now we're getting to crypto winter, that's an interesting time to think about it. You know, when it's super hype and stuff, yeah. definitely not this thing. But follow your heart and go where you have amazing competence. Yeah. So maybe a question for you, actually. What is your unique skill? Unique skill? I mean, my, you know, like, as I'm growing, I'm starting to understand this more and more. And um, so my skill is very, very correlated with my... Uh, with my rising when I was uh, actually I started coding at like uh, 13 or 14 years old and from 13 to 19 I was mostly learning by myself well, I'm gonna learn C++ I'm gonna C sharp and I did this for like six or seven years and when I remember now I'm like this is a really really important skill which is the learning curve the learning curve that I have which is really really compelling uh, and I think this is one of the skills that I have particularly and I emphasize a lot at, at Go My Coach, which is what's your learning curve and what's your speed of learning. Um, we don't hire, for example, we don't hire for the, 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 the culture we have is, it's not really about hiring the smartest people all the time. Sometimes it's really, uh, it's really about hiring people with the highest learning curve, people who are willing to learn really fast and willing to adapt. So that's the skill really I learned how to develop. And actually building a company with zero like company experience, I was like dealing with a lot of things that I never did before, like hiring the team, managing the team, fundraising, managing investors, um, building product, building for users, managing tech. Pre Go My Code, I was basically building uh, iOS games and I was basically coding. That's the only product skill that I had. So that's the first thing, learning curves and your capability to learn uh, skills. Uh, the second skill, which is I, I was lucky enough to, to have few experiences in a different ecosystem uh, in Silicon Valley and get like a really, really high exposure on what was happening back in 2014, 2015, 2013 in a very mature ecosystem in, 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 in Palo Alto, in Silicon Valley. And that I saw, I saw 19 years old kids and 20 years old students that were building companies and were raising funds and raising millions. And me as like as a 19 years old, or as a 16 years old, 17 year old, coming from a small city in, in, in Tunisia, in Sousse, and going to Silicon Valley and meeting 20 years old students, building companies, raising millions, launching products, that's really, really life changing for you. That will change your whole perspective about the limits that you have. Uh, something we don't think about as, you know, I never thought about building a company when I'm in high school, or I never, thought about building for users when I was in high school. It was until I got that kind of exposure uh, to people with the same level of uh, skills and expertise as me, but building companies. So I was lucky enough to get that exposure that I think it's really, really important. And I think now we have the responsibility to, to give that exposure for other students, for other high school students, for other uh, people who want to learn, launch companies. So I think I, I had a lot of exposure from different ecosystems really, really young, uh, early on. And uh, this learning curve, uh, learning skill um, thing, yeah. I, I, these are yeah. the two things that I can really recall. So if I summarize well, basically, yeah. you are one of the best in the world in terms of understanding you know, this, this uh, educational system here, but also having a very early stage exposure in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And you were coding yourself, you were doing it yourself, yeah. which is a, another aspect, which is like the technical aspect. Yeah. And you see, like, basically, Yahya uh, launched Go My Code on his strengths, you know. And it's a bit like the same for me, uh, and what you are talking about, like speed of learning, etc. In the early days of InstaDeep, I basically relearned everything in AI. And uh, for, you know, a year, 
basically went back to school, you could say, and uh, took all the classes that I could take on AI, etc. Uh, you know, I had studied it before, but I essentially learned everything very quickly yeah. and rebuilt myself into an expert. Mm -hmm. So you have to be competent to be able to do that. But you see how you're really pulling on your strengths if you want to get to a good outcome. And I think this is important. The notion that, hey, I'm going to do a project just because I think it's the right moment, or so then you think like it's an opportunistic thing, this will definitely not work. When you're pulling on strength and comparative advantages like you had, I don't think there are many young Tunisians who had a chance to be in Silicon Valley at an early age and iterate and then come back and, and stuff. You see, like w this is when you have an opportunity because you're doing something which others are not doing. It was the same for us. We were doing uh, innovation in AI in Tunis in 2015, 2016, when it was still science fiction for people. So you have to have that mentality that I'm doing something where people definitely do not understand the opportunity or are not doing it for whatever reason, but I'm also extremely competent mm -hmm. at what I do. So in a sense, if someone comes to tell us, hey, your idea is dumb, you could actually listen to that person first, because maybe, maybe it is, but you're probably as competent as that person, if not more. Like if somebody comes to lecture me about uh, top talent in deep tech in Tunisia, and he's from Europe or the US, I probably know that better because this, is my, this was my life, this is all my friends, I know them, I have a better opinion on stuff. So you're on solid ground. The same way you're on solid ground when you're talking about like education and uh, you know, building a model that works and seeing uh, from first on. So I hope that gives you a sense of what it takes. If for whatever reason the project that you're trying to launch doesn't have those uh, capabilities, uh, those uh, assets, and those assets is yeah, you're passionate, you're extremely competent. I like the fact that you, you mentioned you're coding because I was coding too. Like the first AI engineer of InstaDeep uh, was me, and uh, Zohara was coding too, uh, to two tech founders, and she was doing the software part, the UX, the web, the design of products. I was doing like the science, hardcore AI part. And, and so if you are competent, you're passionate, and you have a differentiated uh, experience and point of view in your project, you're already like filling in some of like the key, I'd say, uh, requirements to, to get started. But then again, the, the next one, which is really important, is about the people you do it with. Mm -hmm. And this is another point I want to emphasize. Mm -hmm. Startup is not so much about the exact idea, because the idea will iterate all the time. And you know, you're probably starting with the wrong idea. But it's your ability to iterate. It's like the general field is your field of competence. But exactly how you do it, uh, what are the, the exact definition of the project, yeah. this can change a little bit. And it's more about people. So if you're right. thinking about like uh, co-founders and stuff, you have to do it with people you really feel super at ease with. You know, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, one of the, the best things about hiring uh, of uh, some admin, you actually can Google it, uh, some admin on hiring is, he said like three things about hiring. Like, uh, uh, they usually like, how do you hire people, right? First, are they smart? Second, do they get things done? And the third one is like, do I wanna work with them or not? But first, the co-founders, before hiring. But, but first the Tell us about the co-founders. Like, it has to be long-term, right? Yes, yeah. So, uh, it's a, um, we always say that like hiring is not necessarily a marriage, but it is with your co-founder. Uh, hiring people could not be a marriage, but like having a co-founder, it, it is really, really very, very close to what a marriage would look like. Exactly the same. Like yeah. you will really need to manage the relationship, not just um, professionally, but like this guy's gonna spend at least 15 hours a day with you. So you need to be really, really at ease working with them. There should be like a lot of trust, a lot of transparency, really, really strong value system between both, or it doesn't gonna work. Like 85% of companies, I think 80% of the companies they die. Number one reason is comp is co-founders dispute. They die because co-founders right. are not uh, on each. Like that's why 80% of companies they die because of co-founders dispute. So it's not running out of money. It's not. Uh, product, it's not users, it's co-founder dispute. Yeah. So it's really, really and, and, important. And your co-founder is your brother. So my co-founder is my brother, and it helps to have a, um, a co-founder as a brother because there will be like, they're already like a base of trust and 
uh, understanding. And even though usually when we think about our brothers or sisters, we don't we, we think oh we are completely opposite, right? Like we don't say like I'm like my brother, I'm like sister. It's usually there is a big difference between uh, brothers and sisters. But that could be also very very resourceful and very helpful that right. you don't have necessarily you don't necessarily share the same view on product or users or ops or and that can really lead to a lot of great things. Um, so yeah, and, and for me like like it's not a coincidence at all that Go My Code is successful and the two you you two are brothers because Brother means here, like, really, it is about the trust, like you yeah. said. And it's the same thing for me and my co-founder, Zohra Slim. You know, initially, we met in something completely unrelated. It was in uh, Tatawin, actually. I was doing a project for, uh, like, uh, sports and leisures, trying to help the youth. I was looking for someone to do my website. Nothing to do with, like, elite AI startup in the world, right? Just one thing. Zohra was an amazing person, and she is an amazing person. Like, she is so professional, she works so hard, and she's such a nice person. Like, the mix of competence, <coughs> but trust and values. Yeah. I felt strongly we had really the same values. Huh. We really clicked. Yeah. And we were working at, like, until 2, 3 a.m. On, on, like, the w website of the, of, yeah. the, of the stadium. It's called L'Academie at yeah. the time. Yeah. So she was, like, as hardcore as me. And I was, like, okay, this, this feels right. I told Azora, let's yeah. open a tech company. Yeah. And she's, like, but to do what? I'm, like, I have no clue, but I feel good about it. <laughs> Yeah. And that's exactly how it should start. Th this you, is you feel good about yeah. it. It's yeah. like you, uh, your brother, yeah. you know, you know each other very well. Yeah. Each one has his own strength. It feels good. But we can do something. Yeah. You see, it's like this. Yeah. We can take on the world. Yeah. That's the mentality. And if you don't have that, it will fail very quickly because yeah. the relationship between founders yeah. is exactly a marriage, like you said. Yeah. It will get tested. And of course, the test will come at the worst possible time. And let me share two tests we had, uh, Zora and I, and to show you like the strength of the relationship we've built. And InstaDeep would not be where it is without the strength of the relationship between the, the two yeah. co-founders. Yeah. It's like, first test, we were starting to get some traction. At the time, InstaDeep was very uh, young. We were 2000, late 2015, probably had like eight employees. And mm. then Zora gets an offer from Silicon Valley, from actually oh, wow. one of our clients, he says, Hey, Zora, you are just amazing, you know, come work with us. We did a great package, dollars, Silicon Valley, amazing. Yeah. Very tempting, right? Yeah. And she said no. And she comes to, to see me and she's like, Karim, I said no. And you know, I would really love to go. But we have a team. I gave my word. We're doing this <laughs> together. So I will decline the opportunity. Hmm. You see, like you want to have a founder which ha who has this kind of like moral strength, who's with you till the end, if you want. Yeah. And later on, uh, in the early days of InstaDeep, I was not the CEO. That's an interesting point. At the time, we were more like a tech business, and so Zora was the CEO. And when we really went all in on AI, which was uh, late 2015, 2016, it really made sense for the company that I am the CEO because I'm the driver of deep tech, mm -hmm. hardcore innovation. It's an AI startup. Like, who's going to go talk to like, uh, partners, mm -hmm. etc. And so Zora made something, a, a decision which is very rare. And mm. think about it, like how, like you see, like you should not have ego in these things. Yeah. She decided basically, and we had a conversation about it. Look, instead it was going to be an AI startup. You are the AI expert. You're the driver now. Mm. You're the CEO. Mm. You see, like how many co-founders would accept something like this? So you need to really have a strong trust in each other and ability mm. to do what's right for the company and let your ego on the way yeah. and ability to resist temptations. But think about it. Today, InstaDeep has raised a $100 million Series B. It's uh, the biggest success story of AI from Africa. It's a success story in Tunisia, and I hope Go My Code mm. will be also mm. a huge success story. Mm. Uh, like, all this would not have happened if there was not this super strong bond and trust between us. Yeah. And you see, this been challenged, right? This, those were hard challenges, what uh, that I just described to yeah. you. And so in any sort of uh, entrepreneurial project, you will have those challenges. I don't know yeah. what you... No, I actually, th this is like such a great, great case of initially they started working together at first on a, on a website, on a project. So it actually helps before like going on a venture with the co-founder to start to work on, on a project. 
like a really simple project w w without like any necessarily like a commitment for a co-founder or like so it actually helps to really test with someone test the relationship test the relationship and this is one of the best advice we, we even we're like before you hire anyone uh, do like a one week project with them do a two days project do a one month project if it works okay you can double down on having them as a co-founder on, on hiring them so actually it helps to have a prior relationship with but, but the yeah, people. Yeah, you should right. have a trust also yes that is not yeah. gonna come in a month like but ideally it, ideal situation for example for yeah. you would be I've studied with someone uh. I know that person we were we were working hard on uh, you know like exams and uh. stuff so I know that person is good and there is trust. And then, yes, we do a one month project. Yeah. It really clicks, but yeah. ideally you yeah. have also... Yeah. yeah, trust is like, yeah. you don't have trust since day one. It's something you build through time. It's really like a long process. Like, uh, takes, yeah, it takes, takes years. It takes years to build takes trust. Years. And it takes years also to build some kind of understanding of how the other person works and how do you work and how do we find like a compromise or an agreement or like a way to make things happen together. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so you, uh, you, so you get the idea, you know. Yeah. And here, I, again, I want to emphasize, Goma Code, I believe, will not mm. be the success story that it is today if you were not such a good, strong team mm. of co-founders with the trust, but also differentiated strengths. Yeah. You know, you and your brother, you're not the same. Each yeah. one has his own strengths. Yeah. It's the same with me. Like, ideal situation is strong trust, differentiated skill set. Yeah. Like me and Zora, we don't do the same thing. Yeah. My, her sure. skill set is not mine and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally, both technical yeah. as well. Yeah. So you see, like, if you, each time you click on one of these, uh, yeah. tick one of those uh, like bullet po key, key points, yeah. your project yeah. is much stronger. Yeah. And trust me, you're going to need all of these to have a chance. Like, there's not even to be successful, but yeah. like to have a chance. chance yeah. And then it's like literally years and years of uh, execution, execution, yeah. like very hard. I remember very well at InstaDeep when we made our first, uh, our first uh, 2,000 dinars, like revenue contract. That was a big deal for us at the time. First year, I think we had total maybe something like seven thousand dollars of revenues yeah. wow. and what is funny is since then we've been like essentially like doubling tripling revenues every year and that is how you need to think about stuff also don't think linear because that seven thousand dollars of the first year they were extraordinarily valuable yeah think about it as i am making progress and i'm gonna map my progress on a log curve so you want the you don't want it to be linear in log curves yeah. meaning you want it to be exponential yeah. And if you manage to get something going, yeah. which has exponential potential, you're onto something. Yeah. So disregard the naysayers. Like the first, the first revenues you have, hmm. uh, those are priceless. And the hmm. ability to iterate from that is priceless. Because after that, it is just a matter of just upping the game all the time. It's like a snowball. It yeah. starts rolling yeah. and growing. And uh, actually, yeah. I'd love to hear how you yeah. did that, you know, so the first revenues and stuff. The fact about yeah. Go My Code, we spent the first three years bootstrapping. From 2017 to 2020, bootstrapping as like we raised zero money from investors or VC. So what does that mean is you usually have one month of uh, cash burn. So if you don't make money this month, the next month you're going to die. So we were constantly challenged about the revenues and money we'll make. Because if we don't make money this month, we will die. Um, and we actually had a very, very, and we were like, you know, we were not like just like having the 20 students that we have every four weeks. We were like, let's have 40, let's have 60, let's open more locations organically without any prior investment. And I remember like um, in June 2018, it was one of the hardest months. And we were, we just opened two other locations in Sfus and Sfekas. And the month, we, we, when we started the month, we had, I think, we had 2,000 dinars in the bank account. And at the end of the month, we had to pay 80,000 dinars. So in, uh, in, in four weeks, you need to go from 2,000 to 80,000. So the level really of, um, the level of the, the, the intensity that the, the, and the level of confidence and trust and work that the team should have is really, really high. So if you don't have people who actually really believe into the project, if you don't have people that actually can understand uh, this really well, it's not going to happen. So, so that was really, really challenging. And that was one of the most challenging things at Gomeco, specifically the first three years, because we were always running on a one-month 
uh, I ran away, one month ran away. If you don't make money this month, you will die next month. And uh, the, this is a and fascinating. And it was really intense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, I, I didn't know about this. Yeah. It's very funny because it's very similar to our own story. Mm. We started also as a bootstrap. The company was founded with 5,000 dinars. And that's the, all the money we had for the first three, three years and a half. Mm. It's exactly the same situation. Mm. And I actually believe it's very interesting here. It's, it's very healthy to start as a bootstrap. Uh, so basically very little yeah. money and have that positive pressure to perform like yeah. wh what you described it, it really echoes yeah. on how things were I still they still are like that sometimes in terms of yeah. pressure <laughs> but it's this notion that bootstrap you have to execute all the time and in a sense it forces you to look at reality there is a difference between reality and how you perceive it yeah. In a bootstrap, the difference is not very far because, you know, if you don't make the money, you're going to die. So yeah. it's going to hit you like a truck very quickly. Yeah. If you imagine now you start a project, you raised $100,000 uh, or more, you immediately are going to start making much more expensive mistakes. Yeah. And the DNA of the team will not be the same. Yeah. People will come because you have money. So there will, there will be a risk that the employees that come are not mission driven. Huh. They're more like mercenaries. They're not driven by the mission. Yeah. And so what you described, yeah. and which is very similar to us, that's a very interesting point, yeah. is you have to put the team in a sort of like healthy danger zone. With huh. There is very little money. Yeah. It's a bootstrap. We're iterating. We're seeing what works, what doesn't, etc. Huh. It brings the team together. It creates the yeah. DNA of the company huh. that later on Huh. will radiate to the whole uh, sort of uh, uh, organization which becomes bigger international. So for me, this is a very important point. Mm. And maybe like a takeaway for all of you is in the early days of your company, it actually pays to be a bootstrap. Bootstrap, yeah. yeah. It's don't rush to raise money. Yeah. Raise yeah. Mo raising money early could actually kill your company. Yeah. It would create the wrong culture, the wrong set of expectations and you're not exactly sure about the business yeah. model. Yeah. Well, when you're iterating as a bootstrap, essentially like you're making a lot of mistakes, but they're not costly. Yeah. And at the same time, there's really strong positive pressure to yeah. bring the team together. Yeah. So if you survive bootstrap, yeah. yes, it's exactly the same. It was yeah. like three years or uh, yeah. something. It's yeah. exactly like the same. story. Yeah. You survive that bootstrap, yeah. you actually have now a team, a unit, a company, which is ready to take on the world. Yeah. And now it's a time to start thinking about yeah. like, how do I raise money, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, bootstrapping can help to funnel uh, the energy, uh, the, the company focus. Because as a company, you can do so many things at the same time, right? You can do partnerships, you can do marketing, you can run operations, you can hire people, you can through events, you can build other products. Bootstrapping will funnel your energy, will tell you what's really important is Selling, building, selling, building, and running this cycle. So it actually helps to bootstrap because it will really, really try to find all the energy and it will give you like a strong perspective on what's important to, to grow or like to survive, which are usually not too many things. It's usually two or three things. A building for users, selling, um, a building for the experience, and hiring good people, building culture. And you know, as, as I think in the first three years, what we did was building for users, uh, selling and building culture and hiring people. Purely focusing on that and cutting all of the other uh, stuff. And it that's really, gives really you, important. It's like, uh, you know, uh. you know, war zone, you have the adrenaline rush, your senses are aware because you could die at any time. That is bootstrap. Yeah. And uh -huh. I agree, it gives you extraordinary focus. And there's something also important. Later on, if the project is successful, you're going to be facing uh, difficult customers, difficult investors, mm world-class VIPs, having gone through the pain of bootstrap, you know, I, I, I'll give you as a, as a personal thing. For, for many years, I, I had imposter syndrome. I always think I'm not good enough. So maybe that's why I became very competitive, because I always think, oh, it's not good enough. I could be better. Mm. And so um, when I talk to people, I have a tendency like, to be afraid a little bit about what I'm doing and how explaining it. The bootstrap experience, like you took so much pain it become, you become, how to say, you become legitimate mm. because you know that nobody's went through the same pain as you. When you're talking about your business, mm. there is a feel and a shine that this is really genuine. This guy is not r telling me stories to raise money. 
which means actually you could go and talk to anyone, like, you know, and the best in the business, and you will feel like you're one mm. of them. And that is also very important. Mm. You know, like investors, they sense, like, uh, you know, is this for real or not? Mm. So the genuine aspect of having really done something very hard and mm. original, innovative, it will radiate in everything you do. True. True. And that is a huge asset for future. Sure. You know, yeah. so. I mean, this is a huge asset for investors, but also for users. It's actually more credible to come to the user and be like, I did this and this and this and I bootstrapped this, than coming to them and be like, I've done nothing but take my product or buy my service or invest in my company. It actually builds a strong sense of credibility to users, to investors. To your employees. To your employees as someone who did and operated uh, through the years. Because exactly. you have to lead by example. At the end of the day, if you really want to build uh, an extraordinary business, you have to live and breathe the value of this business. You have to be the example. When it gets really, really hard, you jump in in the trenches with the team and you lead from the front, you know, until you solve the problem. Yeah. You need to have that vibe and it's much easier to have it in bootstrap, you know. So, uh, so yeah. One of the, so I, I made like a, a trillion mistake uh, while building all my code early, early days. Like I was 19, 20, trying to build like startups and I made like so many mistakes. And one of the major mistakes I remember doing is uh, not necessarily funneling the energy of focus early days. There is a, lot, a big mistake I see a lot of founders are doing is, um, is trying to do what's really important for a company at the company stage. A seed stage is really different from a series B stage. Series stage, you should not be building for the company. You should be building for users. Series B and series C, yes, you may be building for the company and less building for the users. As like, seed stage, you don't ne necessarily need to put a lot of energy and work into building processes and building structure and building for the company. Your energy should be really about building for users, listening to users, iterating on the product, cracking, so, surviving, really, <laughs> surviving uh, which is like I meet a lot of founders just starting the company and they're like, I don't have a hiring process or like I don't know how to fundraise or I don't know how to, I don't have an office or like, I don't have I don't have a finance team or like I don't have a business plan or like I have no idea on the the economics of my of my of my company and I'm like dude what's the product how many users what and what's the generally feedback of these users on the product and I think th this is really really critical is you need to learn really to cut all of the noise around the product and around the company and really focus on what's going to make a difference building for the users, building for the product, listening to users, iterating and trying to sell and trying to bring in more users. That's the only thing that you should do at least the first one, two, three years, I'd say. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and mm. if you manage to do this well, essentially you're, you're starting to have revenues coming in. And revenues are actually an interesting, and, and customer feedback. This is an interesting signal that you're in the right direction. Mm. So if you do this well, after a few years, you're actually getting a more valuable information from the market than anything they would teach you in business class or on how to run a startup, etc. I'm talking about your specific positioning, yeah. product, etc. So because you see things and you have the direct live feedback, and your, that feedback matters a lot to you because you don't have any money anyway, so that revenue is really important, you will really learn and become super competent at what really matters, which is sometimes different from what people say matters. Mm. So sure. you, have to, you have that direct learning expertise. Of course, you know, general advice about how to run a startup, how to fundraise, definitely is going to be very useful. But I'm talking like when you're iterating on a specific product, on a specific business positioning of your company, you, it's better to learn from what you see yeah. than what people think should be the way it gets done. Yeah. I give you an example. Instadeep is uh, a leader in AI, okay? For a long time, everybody's like coming to us, why don't you do one product, you scale the product, etc. Because yes, that's the startup playbook. Everybody does that. But me, I kind of resisted this because I was like, what we're doing is different. We're actually a deep tech innovation company. So rather than we build all the product directly and we try to sell them to whoever, we created a system where we engage into collaborations with elite partners, some of the best in the world, and we build a product together. So it's like innovation stage before product. 
Is there a playbook for this? Honestly, I haven't found any. But I don't care because I know it works. We're doing it. You see. So this is what is important. Like, mm. you take advice. You always are willing to accept that maybe you're wrong about something, but also take advice from reality. You know, mm. uh, today with this approach, Instadeep is, you know, a key uh, AI partner to BioNTech. Mm. BioNTech is probably like one of the most influential biotech companies on earth, having designed the COVID vaccine, which is the biopharmaceutical product mm. most successful in history. Mm. Don't you think it's funny that their AI partner, and we're doing a lot of very exciting stuff, you know, mm. is actually an AI bootstrap, a, a Tunisian bootstrap, started with 5,000 dinners. I think yeah. this tells you something. It tells you that from really... From Tatawin. From Tatawin, <laughs> yes. Started in Tatawin, yes. Uh, so it tells you something. Yeah. It tells you, number one, that you need to believe that great success stories can happen, you know. I was surprised sometimes, I am surprised by the quality of what we do, yeah. the amazing opportunities what we have. So a positive project will take you much further with the exponential growth than you would ever dream of. Yeah. But this also tells you something, is Tunisia in, and sort of like the quality education you've gotten, and this is also true for Africa in general, the, 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 the talents we have, etc. We can really do something amazing in this time because now is the time of digital deep tech innovation. And actually, this is exactly what Goma Code is doing yeah. in a funny yeah. way. Uh, us, we're an innovation power hub. But before getting to an innovation power hub and doing crazy yeah. stuff with AI, mm. you need to get the key digital skills to yeah. get there. And that's yeah. exactly what you guys are doing. It's very yeah. I mean, this is a really, really good point, which is you don't necessarily need to play with the books, right? Or you don't need necessarily to play with the standards, which is something I really, really struggled with as a first-time founder. Which is I would have so much input coming to me from all directions, like the people who never built companies, they will come and be like, "Don't do this, do this," or like the people who actually right. built companies historically also in Tunisia would come and be like, "This is not the right way." So you will need to process a lot of input from everywhere. And one of the like, most important skills that you need to know and like, understand really early on is you really, really need to um, articulate your own uh, decision making and your own choices by yourself, which is really, really hard to do um, when you're really young also. Um, and one of the things I really remember particularly when we raised our pre-series A. We, we had the 650,000 USD we just raised. And we were like, OK, it's the year of expansion. We're going to expand to other countries. First person I remember talking to, he was like, don't expand. Expand in Tunisia. You know, it's the second person I talked to, he was like, just, he was like, just expand in one country. Uh, the third person uh, I've talked to, he was like, um, two countries, it's a lot of countries. Don't do then more two countries. So I actually had to come up and be like, we're going to seven countries, and we're going to do it. And the team, they were like, no way we can do seven countries. That's a lot of countries to do with 650,000 USD during a pandemic. Um, so, but we had really strong reasoning that seven countries, it's an important number, and we need to be at seven countries. And I can tell you, if we did not do seven countries, we would never raise uh, the 8 million uh, round that we raised. So you actually had to come up and say no to all of the people you have as like, you know, telling you that don't launch two countries, don't launch one countries, but assume the launch of seven countries, which is an incredible amount of work. So this is such a good, um, good point, right? On like the ability, that you, the ability that you should have to take your own decisions and really learn from the ground. Because I was really, really convinced and I really, truly believed by the product we were building and by the te technical aspect and by the scalability aspect that was in the product, that not everyone would understand that like we use this knowledge graph and there is a way for us actually to control quality through these knowledge graphs and this is how we should do it. But from an external point of view, you wouldn't understand that we could scale education in seven countries or in, in eight countries. But because I was really, really convinced by the model and I've seen it and I tried it on and I was building the tag, B basically, I was extremely convinced by yeah. the scalability of the so model. Basically, so basically, Yahya is saying, oh. don't <laughs> think uh, the limits are where people say the limits are. Think about the limits are based on your own experience and your own capability and thinking about where they, they really are. And so if you have that mentality, you can really turn 
potential opportunities into very big ones. Uh, I, I want to share one with you, mm. which is, uh, you know, you know, the deep learning in Daba is coming to yes. Tunisia this summer. This plus AI hack, which we are also co-organizing, uh, like, like uh, in 2019 on, at uh, the radio stadium, and encourage all of you to, to come and participate mm. to the machine learning competitions. The Indaba, the first Indaba, which was, we went to, which was in South Africa in 2018, we have this amazing opportunity, and this is why we're bringing it, like we lobbied hard to bring it to Tunisia this year. We have this amazing opportunity to meet the best AI researchers in the world. David Silver, the inventor of AlphaGo, uh, you know, which, uh, AlphaZero, which you heard about, like the game in chess and Go, like those amazing AI mm -hmm. systems. The leadership of Google AI, Everybody was there. Mm -hmm. And in particular with the, the DeepMind team, they, we start talking like tech, etc. You know, we're hardcore uh, you know, uh, researchers in AI. And they throw a problem at us. They're like, oh, yes, I'm doing this, but this thing I haven't solved it. And you know, we didn't have time, but this is a hardcore one stuff. OK, so I come back to the team and say, hey, uh, actually, this researcher was Nando De Freitas. He's uh, the lead of the machine learning team of, uh, of DeepMind. He's one of the key authors uh, of the Gato. Uh, for those who follow AI, DeepMind built a, a, an AI system that does 600 different tasks, robotics, chat, playing Atari, yeah. with the same model and same parameters. Like, it's insane what's going on. And so those guys, I'm like, hey, Nando, actually, tell me about this problem. And he said it's very hard, and they haven't done on it. You know what? We're going to solve it. You see? Everybody was like, no, you're, you're, you must be kidding. Like, you know, like, this is DeepMind. And, but no, 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 no. I said, he opened the door here. You know what? We're going to crash into the door. And so for the next six months, we worked super hard. And it was a difficult project. And we found a way to solve the problems. So wow. we sent the paper. I sent the paper to Nando de Freitas. He's like, but this is amazing, Karim. He's like, you know what? We should co-publish this. And suddenly, InstaDeep is a startup publishing joint AI research with DeepMind. We publish anonymously the paper to NeurIPS, the largest conference in the world. Not only we get accepted, we get accepted with spotlight recognition, which means the paper is in the top, you know, uh, considered as one of the top of the conference. And this is basically coming from just us at the time with little funding, etc. But you see what's common between mm. what you said and this story is mm. don't believe it cannot be done. If you have grounds to think that something is achievable, mm. go ahead and build it. Mm. And so you attack everything. Uh, you know, as an early, a still young startup in 2019, we organized AI Hack. Uh, mm. And there's Radius uh, at Radis, like the stadium, huge event. I think some of you might have attended. It was amazing, and that's why we're doing it again this year. But what I'm saying here is, you know, people said, you're crazy, a thousand people in a stadium, mm. whatever, and it cost us a lot of money. I said, no, no, it's the right thing to do, we do it. It got us such great feedback, amazing people joined the team, and so this kind of opportunities, we're going to bring them to this, uh, th this summer to Tunisia, and this will be the largest machine learning and AI event mm. in the history of the country. Yeah. And I'm not kidding, never in the history of the country did you have top DeepMind researchers, top mm. Google AI, Apple, Microsoft, yeah. Facebook Meta, all these people are going to come to Tunisia, meet young talents, and the spirit is giving back. The same way yeah. we uh, you know, benefited from this extraordinary yeah. opportunity four years yeah. ago in 2018, we want to bring it back to the ecosystem. So this brings me to the point on, really, I believe there is tremendous yeah. potential for tech startups in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. But it's about doing. It's yeah. not about, you know, Having yes. talks, etc. It's let's, about let's building. Go, so, know. what's uh, what's uh, what's what's unique about uh, Tunisia? Like, what makes Tunisia a great place to start a company from? And what makes it also hard? And how can you how can we correct the hardness? How can you make it from Tunis to outside Tunis? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's hard? I think you all know what's hard, right? <laughs> I don't need to lecture you on what's hard in Tunisia. We all banged our heads on the wall. We all lost a thousand time uh, building the paperwork, so going for doing legalizing a signature, all that stuff. Yeah. So where the opportunity is, is I genuinely believe Tunisia can be a really leading hub in Africa and in the Arab world when it comes to tech and deep tech, even yeah. deep tech, AI and other technologies. So why? It's because, you know, 
the educational system, even though people are saying it's going down and stuff, yeah. it is still top notch. I am amazed mm. by the talents we have. I am amazed by, you know, like even someone yeah. like you, Yahya, like yeah. young, externally talented, externally sharp. Mm. This gives me hope for the future of this country. Mm. And so the mix of elite tech talent we have, which right now their mentality is just, I want to get out of the country and work to Europe or work in mm. the US. Well, in reality, the opportunity is much bigger than that. Mm. And so how could you turn the country into uh, an amazing hub of talent and tech and success mm. stories and vibrant ecosystem, many huge success stories, is if we focus on digital, yeah. this is critical. If you don't focus on digital, you're going to be run into the ground, like literally, like try to import, export stuff. Good luck. Yeah, mm. this kind of thing. So digital, you press a button, you're literally like sending bits and your product is in New York, is in mm. China, is in Europe. Mm. So that's the number one point. And the second point, which I think is also another common uh, DNA mm. between InstaDeep and, and Go My Code, mm. is the fact that from day one, and you express this very mm. well, you have an international ambition. Mm. This is not a Tunisian project. Mm. It is an international ambitious project run from Tunis, mm. which is very different. So from day one, even later on, the investors, the people you mm. onboard, you want them to be people who have an international prospect. Yeah. When you raise money, don't raise money from local institutions, which I believe do not have the right standards yeah. to build the successes of tomorrow. Go and raise from the world's best investors. Now, the good news is they're all looking for projects like yours. Like everybody's looking for amazing projects like, yeah. like InstaDeep, like Go My Code, etc. Yeah. So if you have enough quality in your project, interna like in international scope, raising money is actually easy. So believe it or not. If you go try to raise money from local uh, institutions in Dinar, it's going to be extraordinarily hard. Yeah. And it's going to get you probably not very far. So there are smart investors locally, yeah. go with the smart ones, and those are international in the background, or go straight out to international yeah. investors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, something, so there is a, I call them the A's um, as the advantage of launching a company from Tunis, and the B's as like the barriers to launch a company from Tunis. I can outline a lot of barriers. One of them is we have really, really complicated uh, exchange, um, currency exchange laws. as. To launch an international company, you're not going to launch it with dinars. To for us to launch Comaico Dakar or Lagos, or we cannot launch a country with dinars. To crack a country, you need USDs. But sure, the money you're making in the country is in dinars, and it's very hard to convert dinars. So that makes it really, really hard to expand with dinars and with local investors. So what you need to do is you need to raise in USD, uh, and to raise in USD, you need to look outside. You need to look for international investors with a strong ambition for Africa, uh, which we have a lot today, and it's extremely increasing. The, 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 the money is not the problem anymore. Money, so yes, money is not the problem, and this is really I, I, something I learned really the, 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 through the recent fundraise, which is money is not the problem, and there is this interesting multiplier effect that is happening right now in the market as we're going to have more successful startups, and we're going to have more successful AI companies, and we're going to have more successful ad tech companies. And that will bring a lot of positive effect to the, to, the, to the ecosystem. One of the things that I can really recall, which is the Instead fundraise fueled the Gome Coach fundraise. The very, very same investors of Instead really, really believed in the Gome Code model. And they invested in Gome Code because they've seen it working at Instead so there is this multiple effect that we never had before that will play in your advantage. So it's really not a question yeah. of um, investor. It's really a question of uh, uh, executing and operating. Uh, yeah, exactly. And just on that, so if you're trying to have a project, trying to raise money, you have a hard time. It just means that you're not talking to the right investors or that your project is not set up for international success. But because, trust me, like the number of people we talk to that are, as you said, looking for the next success story, mm -hmm. having been successful in their previous investments, could be in Sadiq, could be others, is insane. So if you set up the project the right way, you will find funding. And uh, that, that, is, uh, that, that is something that has mm -hmm. completely changed recently. But now to the second point you mentioned, mm -hmm. 
we know, like, this is actually our dream and our secret plan for the future. It's like, mm -hmm. how do we make this country a deep tech leader? Mm -hmm. How do we make this country relevant for the future like South Korea is relevant today? Well, we need success stories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, the fact that the Series B of InstaDeep uh, so shattered some so-called sort of glass ceiling in terms of fundraising yeah. in Africa, yeah. which is, I mean, I'm pleased to hear that yeah. it's directly benefiting you. Yeah. The same way the success of Go My Code will benefit others. Yeah. This is the secret plan. It's like we built from strength to strength, from success to success. And if we do this with the right sort of strategy, it will create incredible opportunities yeah. to all of you and are incredible opportunities to give back. You know, yeah. what's interesting about our companies, yeah. they're doing a lot to give back to the ecosystem. I mean, I just told you, like, the two large events we're doing mm. this summer, uh, Go My Code is having an incredible positive beneficial impact on the ecosystem. So success shows that success is possible. A smart Tunisian or a smart young African, uh, potentially having equipped himself with great skills mm. from Go My yeah. Code, you know, he could yeah. work for a company in Europe, have a great yeah. salary. Okay, yeah. fine. Because he could build something much more disruptive. Either yeah. join a disruptive team here yeah. and enjoy scalable uh, yeah. exponential returns mm. or build his own project and, and do it even yeah. at a larger scale. So yeah. we want to change the mentality. Yeah. We want to show it's possible to be successful from here. And if you're a bit ambitious, you want to go to Europe and US. But if you're really ambitious, build a big success because yeah. it's possible today. Yeah. There is also something interesting. Um, that I think a lot of founders need to think about smartly, which is you have two companies that went from seed stage to Series E and Series B in ad tech and in AI. So there is, a comp there is an opportunity here. So you can, meaning that the market is really interesting to build for education and to build for AI right now from Tunis. And I think for education specifically, because I can see this, there's a million things that a lot of founders can build for education. I think the market the educational market in Tunisia is really mature. So you can really build for a lot uh, in education. And I think there is a compounding uh, effect, which is like, Go My Code, if anything, is going to grow. And it's going to go to Series B, Series C. And Go My Code will start thinking about supporting other ed techs and supporting other education founders. So there is a no same for AI, same for InstaDeep. So there is an opportunity to go behind these companies and try to build and try to also solve their pains. And I, I, I saw this happening a lot in Lagos. Like, uh, Flutter Waves is buying a lot of fintechs. It's buying a lot of fintechs that started a few years after Flutter Wave, for example. So there is like a comp uh, compounding effect uh, behind education and AI yeah. in Tunis, which is actually it's a really good, mature and opportunity for you to build for education and AI right now. And, it's, uh, uh, and the compounding uh, factor mm. is basically entrepreneurial success mm. and entrepreneurs wanting to give back to the ecosystem. So I know both Yahya and I were mm. totally into this vibe. And so it's a revolution in mentality. You know, we still live in a world, unfortunately, where people think that uh, wealth is limited, that wealth mm. comes from the ground, and that you know, fighting for the ground and you know, the oil and stuff is the most important thing on, on, on Earth. But in reality, uh, we want to create a culture of abundance. Wealth is unlimited. The only limiting factor is yourself. Mm. Digital wealth is unlimited. Doesn't mean it's easy to get. You need to work very hard and all the advice we're giving you, etc. But potentially, it is unlimited and it's available mm -hmm. to you. So this revolution of mentality, it also means like competitors, like old school uh, Tunisia, old school Africa. Mm -hmm. Oh, my competitor is someone I never want to talk to or my like that other uh -huh. company, etc. I never share my secrets, etc. Us, we're radically open. I'm telling you everything is going on about mm -hmm. InstaDeep. You tell everything's going on about Go My Code. And we want to empower you, and we want to build relationship between new successful tech companies in Tunisia and Africa, where success brings success, mm. where the pie keeps growing. It's not about, oh, this is a small pie, how much a percent I can get of that small pie, and you know, that's the mentality. No, uh. the pie is unlimited, and let's grow, and yeah. you know, let's build it together. Uh. And so, for me, this is an extraordinary opportunity. I don't think... Tunisia, and for that matter, Africa, will ever have this opportunity again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, invited incredibly at a panel at the opening of the Africa Forum. So this is the 1,500 CEOs, like most famous CEOs, uh, or most successful CEOs in Africa. Incredibly, they told me, Karim, 
can you come with heads of state for the opening panel? So I was there with the president of Ghana and stuff like never happened. I was like, okay. Mm. So I said, you know what? I will tell them what is really going on. And I told them this, and this is why I want to share it with you. AI and digital deep tech innovation is the transforming technology of our time, of your life. Mm. It's going to be bigger than the internet, economically and socially. This is as big as it gets. And if you follow a little bit what's going on, you will see that this is really happening, okay? The difference is, the last time we had a really disruptive technology that really changed the order of countries, changed the winners, redefined everything. In the 20th century, it was nuclear power, okay? Nuclear power, think about it. This is as hidden, secretive, government controlled as you can imagine. Like literally, yeah. like building nuclear power capability is not gonna happen, you need like, uh, resources like plutonium and others, or uranium that are impossible to source. Uh, the knowledge is very hidden, very secretive, like people are killing, literally killing themselves for that knowledge. You never hear about nuclear engineers, or yeah. like, they're always hiding them. But, yeah. but it's the, the impact of nuclear energy is crazy, both yeah. in war and peace. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's the same with AI, but guess what? AI is open, AI and digital, it's completely open. It's and what the skills you're learning with Go My Code, they're exactly the right digital skills to become uh. a contributor into the most disruptive technology mm. and opportunity of your life. Uh. And that is insane. That is a crazy opportunity. This means Africa, and in particular Tunisia, can leapfrog. What does it take to get there? It gets, we work very, very hard and we focus on building there mm. rather than trying to, hey, optimize salary here or get a job here. Focus on building. There is so much to be built. I, I totally yeah. agree with you. Like the number of successful projects that could emerge, yeah. or the opportunities that you have joining potentially, and already like successful a sort of like tech first company like mm. Go My Code or like Instadi. Go for those. Don't go for a classic job because that's part of the past. And the future is happening at insane speed. Yeah. You know, yeah. like that's what people don't tell yeah. you. So yeah. this is. So I wanted to convey. Yeah that sense of urgency, yeah. but also sense of opportunity. Yeah. Because I really believe that uh, founders like Yahya, yeah. success stories like Go My Code, like InstaDeep, are the future of this country. This is not a small matter. Mm. This is the most important thing that is going to happen in the next 20, 30 years. Mm. Either we are part of the story, mm. part of the train, or the train will leave without us. Mm. This is such a good point. I mean, a lot of people ask us at Go My Code and be like, what do you really do at Go My Code? And we're, we, through the years, we had different answers. So we'd say like, we're a school, we're a platform, we train people, we're like a digital skills platform. But it made me a few years to realize really what we do. And it, it, it took me also a lot of traveling to, and especially with the expansion that we did, I spent a lot of time going to Dakar, to Abidjan, to Lagos, Casablanca, to the countries where we, are, we, where we operate. And something I really realized really, really well, which is, Probably in the lifetime history of the humanity, we never had this before, which is we have a lot of youth, specifically in Africa. It's a 200 million people between the age of 14 and 200. Uh, uh, between 14 and 30. Sorry. It's a 200 million people between the age of 14 and, uh, and 30. Maybe in the future we live to 200. Who knows? AI, you know, like, could happen. Uh, could happen, yes. Could happen, which is a really, really high dense. Uh, these countries are really high dense with youth. Okay, so and you see a lot of like young people living in their countries, interacting with the country's economy, but they only get to see what's happening outside. They only get to see this global digital economy. Like you know, in Tunisia, as Tunisians, we see what's happening. We know what's happening. We we are following the trends in Europe, in Asia. But we, we, we see the digital global economy, but we live in a really old school economy, right? And I was like, what does it take for our people to be really, really active in this global economy, in this new digital economy, and get beyond the local old school economy? And I think this is what really Gomaikod is doing, which is if you learn a tech skill, meaning as you can work outside, you can work uh, remotely, you can get to work on tech projects, you can get to work on open source projects, you, can, you, can, you get to interact with people from all over the world from your existing countries. We have a lot of, lot of students in Lagos who work for European companies, a lot of students in, in Abidjan who work for a Tunisian company. So tech actually created this 
distribution in global economy, which is like we don't have this concept of local economy. You have like a one global economy and everyone and, and interacting with, which is the first time in humanity, like as a Tunisian, you can live a dent in the global economy and not, not just in your country economy. And this is what really Gomeko is trying to do is like, we really want to make people active and really contributing in the global economy, in this new digital economies, even from their existing countries and from their mother countries, which is something really, really important. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, and, and basically like what you guys doing and what we're doing is essentially the same, is empowering young talents with advanced digital skills to be successful and master the technologies that will make history in this, kind of, in, yeah. the, in, in, this, in this century. This is as simple as that. But the good news of all this is the barrier to entry is extraordinarily low. Actually, I like to see what you guys are doing as even lowering the barrier to entry mm. into the digital world. Because mm. Go My Code, like it really gives you useful skills at a cost which is super reasonable and literally giving you the ability to evolve in this world. So with the right mentality, you can go very, very far. But remember everything we told you. On, on, a, on, on themes, specific topics on which you have an unusual differentiated uh, advantage. Mm. But this is happening and you can really be part of it. And try always to learn from the very best. I, I like mm. what you said about the fact that now the world is connected, that Tunisians uh, can be part and Africans can be part of the digital economy. So go and learn from the very best. So you're thinking about startups. Go and do, uh, learn from startup school from Y Combinator, the best accelerator in the world. Don't localize you, yourself in terms of like uh, ambitions, capabilities. Go and learn from the very best and then come up with a product that could be local but differentiated, world class, etc. Yeah. But so really like see yourself, you're part of the global digital infrastructure. Yeah. Go My Code is helping you be part of it. And essentially you can start to become a contributor to this ecosystem, mm. iterate from there, later mm. on raise money, etc. But you're the first generation for whom this is possible. Even us at the beginning in 2014, when we started, there was no funding available for mm. a deep tech AI company like us in Tunisia. That mm. was really science fiction. Mm. Uh, now there is a lot more funding available. The number of teams in the world really looking and digging and trying to find the, stand, the new hot startup before everybody else is insane. insane and yeah. it's about the quality, yeah. raise the bar, yeah. take for standards, world-class standards. Huh. You know, yeah, yeah, he was in Silicon Valley. I worked in the US, okay? Mm. So you could say we had an advantage and it's true, but I'm very transparent. The fact that I studied at Ecole Polytechnique in France, I worked in the US, I was admitted at Stanford and I worked in applied mathematics in New York. You were in Silicon Valley, you saw it for sun. This is an advantage. But here is the point, and this is a very important point. You see, we are still a generation where we needed to go to the US to get the knowledge and come back to build. But now I believe it's not necessary anymore. Why? Because the knowledge is available on the internet. But it takes more than knowledge. It takes the right nurturing environment. And I think it's a shared ambition no. that instead of go my code, are strong contributors to this positive environment where you're going to find mentors for your project, yeah. you're going to find help. Later, you might even find funding, right? Like you said, yeah. uh, investors, uh, like entrepreneurs giving yeah. back, companies giving yeah. back. So we're sort of removing the need to have to travel mm. to build digitally disruptive businesses. And so my dream is one of the next big successes we're going to hear from Tunisia in digital and tech is actually from an entrepreneur who grew up, did all his career in Tunisia, and is an international player, meaning this is a product, it's a global product, it, uh, he has global investors, but he didn't need to go anywhere to do this. Yeah. And I believe this is possible, especially with a nurturing environment which you're trying to push, yeah. which is essentially recreating the conditions of Silicon Valley here, yeah. including the fear of missing out, the yeah. funding, the advice, etc. Yeah. And yeah. I think that should be our common ambition, yeah. And I think it's possible, actually, and uh -huh. uh, we're going to try to do yeah. it, you know? Yeah. Great. Um, so I think we can start taking questions. Uh, so feel free to, like, uh, throw questions and, like, start asking. Yeah. Yeah, okay. 
Um, yeah, the, the, the audience was particularly uh, excited. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, 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 if we don't like, stop, like, it's going to take us another Yeah, we, we could go on all day. You, know? all you day, have to yeah. stop us. <laughs> Uh, I'm uh, Mesh Sufi. I'm the founder of a uh, startup that is building a solution for the retail uh, industry, for uh, La Grande Distribution. Um, I wanted to know what makes uh, an investor better than the other, because I'm talking about uh, with a lot of investors, and let's say 90% of them is uh, are willing to give money, and uh, I don't need uh, only money, I need the gu um, guidance. And sometimes not bad, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, you actually want an investor that is giving you money and not trying to interrupt you too much. Mm. Just is available when you need him. You need him for introduction, for example. Yeah. Guy reaching out a certain person, a certain company. And you know he has the contact, he's available and he will help. But yeah. otherwise, he's stepping out of your way. It, it's, it's funny because uh, investors, they will always come to tell you, oh, I'm going to help you run your business better, or I'm going to have an expertise into scaling. Forget about that. Okay. You don't want any advice or expertise. The only advice you want is when you are going to ask for advice. Let yeah, you, if you say, I need help, you raise your hand, then you want that person to help. But beyond that, uh. if they could just let you run the show and demonstrate that you are yeah. uh, delivering results and say, to, well done. Yeah. That's what the best investor you can do. Okay, about. I have another you tricky know, question. One question you should uh, ask when you talk to investors, which, which is like, what have they done or what companies they have invested in? Simply. So for me, the best investors are, are uh, founders. As investors who pre-investing were building companies. For me, the best investor is Karim because he built a company, he grew a company from C to Series B, and now he's investing. So he really understands. For me, that's the best type of investor, is people who actually done startups, built startups, and after uh, started investing. So that's for the best uh, investors type, and they called operators investors, as they operated before. The second type of good investor is they usually they have a good portfolio as the investors of Stripe and Airbnb, and they have relatively like good traction, you know. So that also helps to have investors with traction as invested in companies that grew and been sold and like, you know, Africa Invest, they have a strong traction in Africa uh, as they invested in Ancedi before. So it makes sense for us to have them an, as an investor because they invested for Ancedi. So look also for traction and like, you know, what kind of companies they invested in before. So these are my advice. What, what I think is uh, international uh, outlook is critical. Yeah. Never invest with a player who is focused on just a single market, a sort of narrow-minded on a single market. That is not the investor you want, and he will try to drive you off track. Oh. Yeah, some startups actually have issues growing uh, to their full potential simply because of the yeah. wrong investor base yeah. and the pressure they're getting. From. Um, the problem also with international investors, they don't look necessarily at you if you're just in Tunisia. So it actually helps to be in different countries so you can bring international investors. It helps, huh? I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but it helps to be in multiple countries so you bring that kind of international investors. What uh, my investors are also my clients. <laughs> That's good sometimes. Yeah. It depends on the nature of your product. Yeah, I'm doing B2B and the market is narrow like uh, in terms of uh, agents. Like uh, the, we have the, This is a very good one. Uh, we're a B2B business also. We have investors uh, who are our clients. We have uh, BioNTech, we have Deutsche Bank. The reason it works with us is because we're building great relationships and long-term relationships with them, and so an investment makes the relationship even long-term. You have to be careful that if you're a B2B business, it doesn't sort of cannibalize the other opportunities you have. I For us, it meaning like, imagine you, the, your market is like, you know, 20 big players. One of them wants to become really close to you and invest in you. Problem is, others might be then afraid to do something with you because you are seen as you're part of their competition. Yeah. The reason why it works for Instadeep is because Instadeep is a global AI company. And so we have multiple verticals. So we have B2B relationships, but they're not in the same sector. So those do not see themselves as competitor to each other. So for us, it works. Maybe for others, it doesn't. So be careful if it is a single vertical. Yeah. 
it's probably not a good idea to take the money. If you have multiple verticals and this is not going to be seen as, oh, you took a side, then maybe you can have that. So you have to look at the drawbacks. Yeah. Actually, in Tunisia, I have, uh, in terms of number, I have four, now four clients. So, uh, MG, um, uh, Carrefour, Aziz, uh, uh, Carrefour, 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 Carrefour,
trying to optimize uh, stuff. Like yeah. do how, take best advice and yeah. just do it, but don't waste time on yeah. the details of this kind of thing. You know how you sometimes when you write code, it doesn't need necessarily to be perfect. Like it's hard coded code. Like it's a, uh, it, it takes some time to like test and clean and like document the code and like, and it's fine at first to like start with whatever it, it if it works, okay. Uh, <laughs> this is like exactly. You didn't like, like you know like yeah. a, a good plan executed uh, today is better than a perfect plan executed next week. Just get going yeah. and don't worry. Later on, people will come and tell you, okay, we reincorporate, yeah. we do this. Okay, fine. Yeah. Take the right advice. And the good thing is there are a lot of solutions. There is a million solution. It's gonna be probably tough. But this is something I'm precisely planning to do, which is I'm gonna create like an article on how to make it from Tunis legally. Because uh, it's a, it's a legally it's because a it's a big challenge, and I personally struggled with a lot. You know, it took us, you know, five years to get to this stage, where I know for a fact if we had the right knowledge, maybe at first, it maybe will take us like three years to yeah. to to do this stage. But so this is now the the the, the field is play like yeah, yeah. There will be standards and best standards, and you should definitely yeah. do this because yeah. this is a point which is uh, critical. Yeah. 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 So on the my side, question, uh, yeah. uh, on uh, AI, and it's a question about IP, essentially, intellectual property. We have IP agreements with our customers. In general, Instadeep is, as an AI player, has its own technological stack and IP, which is about the AI. But with the application, sometimes we do actually give IP to our partners in a specific uh, use case, and this is usually what they're interested in. So there are ways to do this. And you talked about AI regulation. Yes, it's good that AI gets regulated because AI is the nuclear power of this uh, century. And so this means that with a powerful technology like this, bad users will start emerge and will become actually incredible. So you, ne you need a bit of regulation. But it wouldn't affect us because instead by design does not do bad stuff or controversial stuff. We do things which are unequivocally good for society. Saving mm. lives, trying to detect dangerous variants before uh. they start growing, uh, improving the efficiency of large railway networks. Uh. These are not controversial stuff. So we steer away from this, but definitely regulation uh. is needed because the technology is insanely powerful. Uh. I think you saw recently uh, an engineer actually going out and talking about like the, the fact that hey, these systems are they look like they are conscious. Conscious. You know? yeah. For me, you know, it's definitely not conscious or not yet, but it tells you that we are sort of passing the Turing test. You know, the old Turing test that hey, now you are at a point where you cannot recognize if this is a, a person or an AI, and this means that if you cannot recognize this is really dangerous and could be badly used. So we definitely need some sort of regulation. Uh, the key thing is this, a smart regulation would be perfect. Mm. It's going to take a lot of time, probably 50 years, to get to a stage. <laughs> Maybe less, I don't know. Maybe less. But it's it's going to take less. a lot of time. Never say never. <laughs> and it's going to take like, there is a, like an effect to get those regulations up, like used in Africa also. Like, you know, there is a, but yes, yeah. you never know, right? Yeah. Cool. Question there. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hello, my name is Yusuf, and I work in a field that completely goes to put you in sleep. I work in insurance. And, yeah. And, uh, okay. Completely. Yeah, everybody likes insurance, and especially nobody likes talking about it. So, um, yeah, my partner and I are trying to, uh, not to make you love insurance, but to uh, try to uh, make things easy and uh, more digestible. And um, my question, I think, I yeah, to be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, actually, uh, I don't know if you know uh, so much about finances and the insurance market, but it is a, a heavy regulated industry. Our uh, lawyer friend here knows better than us that you can't uh, enter to uh, play in the insurance market uh, globally unless you have the right agreements and capital and so on, so on. Uh, let alone in Tunisia. So uh, we are trying, um, my question is about how to move from an initiative to a business because actually we are trying uh, to launch, uh, we are actually in the final stage of launching an initiative that uh, helps um, people understand 
uh, insurance products and how to uh, benefit from insurance. Uh, here in Tunisia, in the Tunisian dialect, actually we took the legal uh, uh, contracts and we tried to make it as simple as possible So and to build something around it, uh, around it to make um, people at least they have a source to turn to uh, when they are confronted with the... So maybe the question is like how do you thrive in very regulated markets? Insurance is one of the things, it could be also fintech. In Tunisia, fintech is really highly regulated, yeah. right? It could be insurance, it could be... And how to move from an initiative. N not pay we are not going to charge people to get information, but we are thinking about investing efforts and uh, ideas in, this, uh, in the risk so industry. My advice in general. As a young startup, <coughs> try to avoid heavily regulated uh, situations. So I know your insurance is heavily regulated. Find a way that the product you do is not regulated. It's just an advice or... Find a way that it's not regulated. Because the reality of regulation, this is true worldwide, it's particularly true in Tunisia and in Africa, is that it will get you, it will slow you down something incredible. Incredible. And so... Uh, if you can avoid, you should avoid. Because startups live and die by momentum. St startups live and die by, what did you do next week? What are you doing next month? And if the answer is that I'm waiting for the okay of the regulator. And these people, they're, they live in another planet compared to startups. Yeah. For them, you wait uh, four months is normal. Yeah. You, four months, you could be dead by then. So try to avoid as much as possible. And if really your business model is, I must get an okay from regulators, you should ask yourself in which country you do this. And you sh it should be a very large country where the regulator is kind of like relatively fast. It should not be a small country with a very heavy or slow regulatory regime. That's my advice. Because you will be dependent on people really for the life of death of your business, which do not care and will not care about it. Yeah. I'll tell you two things. One thing, it really helped a lot that Professional training is not, for Goma Code, is not like highly regulated um, as it is in Africa. So it actually helped that we are not in a very regulated uh, industry, which is like professional training. Nothing, no, almost barely no regulation. And that helped really, really speed up the process of expansion, trying things, rolling out products faster. So it helps massively to be in a non-regulated market. My second thing is you should talk to Enis. Uh, our friend there of uh, Flusi, of Kawan, which is a rising fintech in Tunisia, I think he would advise you, uh, he would probably advise you better than anyone on uh, being in a highly regulated uh, and building a fintech. Uh. Actually, maybe you answer the question. Yeah. No, I can, I can definitely. Uh, so we've made all the mistakes possible when it comes to dealing with regulators, having the product structure, being closely tied to uh, constraints that we cannot control. Uh, so definitely, even in terms of our own expansion, we're looking at restructuring the product itself to be less uh, reliant on those factors. Uh, when it comes to getting started, I think what you're doing uh, could, te could definitely work. It's just about getting one partner or one paying client, which is, per for example, a big insurance company that wants to dive into this with you. Um, so, so you don't have necessarily to go through, say, getting your own license or getting your own uh, complicated structure going. You can work with the constraints of that market and launch something that isn't necessarily waiting for new regulation to come in. I think that that's key. For example, when we started, um, and I'll preface this by saying we took three years to get the, the, the authorizations to launch, but. Um, it would have taken a lot more had we waited for a change of regulation instead of interpretation of the current law. So we actually took the text of law, we read it, even though we're tech people uh, at heart, we just switched into a different mode of um, looking at current law, reading it, and interpreting it with the, uh, with, with the eye of a tech person who can use technology to work within the constraints of the law. Yeah. It's not particularly fun, but I think if you choose to work within regulated sectors, that is, once you move in onto the other side, is a huge barrier to entry for competitors. So it gives you uh, some leeway once, once you actually uh, launch your product or figured out these constraints, that becomes the muscle and expertise that allows you to maybe go faster than anyone else who's trying to copy what you do. This is, and we can talk yeah, later. The, the, <laughs> the interesting thing about regulation, which is 
they, they don't necessarily change out of nature. So they usually, historically, when you look, they usually change out of pressure or out of social behaviors change. So if you come up with something that will put some pressure on the, the, the social economy or like the government or like, the government will eventually need to, to do some change, you know? So it's either to, to come up from the other side. So if, if Lucy is doing a lot of work, like around FinTech, and it's getting a lot of traction and it's growing, and if Lucy found like a, a hack or a way to get in, and it grew, that's gonna put a lot of pressure on regulators to start, regu to start changing regulations. And it's usually that, you know, it's, it's only after six years of Uber existence that they started, or like trying to regulate, uh, like, you know, the, or it's only- the best yeah. advice, and this is true yeah. for everybody here. If you're starting a company, a, a startup in Africa, and in Tunisia, try to minimize your regulatory footprint. Try to minimize the, your government intervention footprint. I'll give you a concrete example. I, I learned this the hard way. So what I'm telling you here cost me a lot of money. Because before in Sadiq, I failed the project because it was just requiring lots of interaction with customs and stuff, and it killed the project. Okay. So really like try to minimize to the max. Uh, mistakes you should not do, for example. We, if you look at the, the text in law, uh, you know, I come from Tatooine, right? So there are lots of like, uh, oh, it's a social development area, or like lots of help, like uh, you're supposed to, like, like the football uh, sports leisure. Oh, the project was supposed to help, uh, like get a lot of state help and whatever. The reality is, even if you're supposed to get a lot of government help, you should bypass that and not take that government help and not ask for it. You know why? Because even if it happens that you get the help, it will take years and it will slow you down. It will put you in a tough. So learn to rely on yourself. That is the biggest lesson. Minimize the footprint to the minimum, ideally zero. And don't expect help. Let others get the help. You are young, you're talented, you're fast moving, you can get funding. You don't need to make a business plan based on when you will get state help or other large government or development bank help, etc. It doesn't work for startups. Trust me, this cost me a lot uh, to have give you this advice, yeah. and this will save you a lot of time. Yeah. It's a really, really good advice. Yeah. This, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I am last, I am founder of management of management consulting company. It's very different from from okay. yours. I was in tech, but now in management. I have a question here. I have a challenge about people retention. Because to have an amazing success, you need an amazing people. And, and likes, I feel like most people are here to, to learn new things for, uh, for two, three, four years and looking for a job in France, in Silicon Valley. And four years is not bad. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what I was thinking. <laughs> I thought you were going to say like six months or like one year. That's like... Uh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so what are your secrets to for people retention? Uh, yeah, so the first, uh, first secret is you need to lead from the front. Yeah, it's like if the founders... Uh, the, the, the worst retention situation for a Tunisian business, the owners are in Europe or in the US or somewhere in the world. They are not here, like the founders or the owners or whatever. This is run here on the concept of, oh, this, we have this office because it's cheaper. This will fail and retention will, will be very low, okay? People will leave. The right way to do it is the founders should be here, or at least some of the founders, like Zohara, my co-founder, is running the Tunis office. So she is here with the team. I come regularly. It's more COVID, I couldn't come too much, but now I'm all the time coming to Tunis. So that's the engagement. And the second part, make things exciting, you know. People, they don't work just for the money, you know. Even though we talk a lot about they leave because they have better salaries in Europe, yes. Actually, people love a challenge. If you show them this is an exciting mission, if you show them there is progress, potential off the scale, they will stay with you even if you don't have the best salary offer. That's another point. And the third part is you should be very generous with stock options because we're talking about building exponential wealth here. Yeah, Bill Gates did not become rich, or Elon Musk did not become rich taking a salary. Mm. They became rich because they had a share in a very successful, exponentially growing business. So it's important that all your employees receive stock options. You know, this mm. is our culture at uh, Instadeep. 
you know, even our, you know, when we started our, our house cleaner, Om al Khir, at InstaDeep, she got shares of InstaDeep, yeah? And we have a plan so that all the time we give shares to all the employees based on merit. But it's this participation thing. If you run a two-tier office, if you don't care about people, you don't have an exciting mission, and you don't get them to be a shareholder of your business and your success, well, obviously, it's going to fail. Mm -hmm. If you do all this, maybe they will stay, and they will become great uh, partners with yeah. time and great future leaders of the company. Yeah, yeah. retention is really, really a challenging uh, thing to, to manage. And um, I'd say, you know, for, go for example, GoMyCode is a really, really big, it's a big people company. Like, it's a... It's not like it's a 500 teachers. It's a, we have a 5,000 students. And you'd say for every 10 students, you have a teacher. So that's almost 500 teachers studying, uh, uh, teaching. Uh, so it's a big, big people company. So how do you retain the teachers? And especially what you learn that people in tech, they usually want to code. I mean, they usually want to write code and less teach early on in their careers. So you'll have more people in tech wants to build product and wants to code, and less people who wants to teach. So you actually need to convince these experienced tech people and these like really good tech people to teach, which is a really, really hard thing. And you, should, and you need to convince them to do this during the weekends and on a Saturday afternoon, on a, on a Sunday afternoon, and like full time during the week. So I would say three things for, for me that I saw really, really important. One, it actually helps, it helps to keep people if you hire for culture and not just uh, so it's really important to hire for culture as if you have people leaving it's not necessarily uh, a, a company it's it, it could be a culture as like the person is not necessarily fit for the culture so it actually helps to be set, set and be like okay what kind of things I really what kind of behaviors and skills that I really appreciate in the people that I hire for example for us we really want to, want, want to hire builders. Like we really want to hire people who build stuff before. You know, it helps to have builders in the team. So you, it, it's really important to hire an interview for, for culture and ask people like, what do you, what, for example, like we ask this for a lot of people is like, what do you appreciate in your colleagues? And what do you really value on your manager as like a value or like as a skill? And it helps to hire, for culture to optimize um, yeah. longer on. So yeah. culture, this also means that you have to be passionate. Remember what we're talking about at the beginning. If you are passionate, passion is contagious. They will get passionate about what you do. And so you have to keep things fun, mm. exciting. Mm. And it's an underappreciated thing. But I actually believe that companies that give back a lot to the ecosystem actually retain people way more, meaning that if you have a good karma kind of culture, that this is not a company which goal is to just make money and that's it, and we all go to the beach, yeah? It's like there's a culture, really agents, positive agents of change. We're helping, we're doing lots of initiatives which can be actually very costly or very time consuming and working on yeah. weekend stuff. Have that vibe that this is a movement, that mm -hmm. this is beyond a business, you know? And if you look at you know, what you guys are doing and what we are doing, mm -hmm. There is a little bit of that. It's, yeah. it's a bit of a movement, like yeah. change things, improve the ecosystem, yeah. give back to society. Yeah. This is ultimately what can, be, can create a, a great company. So yeah. there is a huge mission behind, which is a mission that is beneficial to all. Yeah. I give you an example. Tesla is a mission-driven company. They want to revolutionize transportation and reduce the impact uh, and develop like sustainable mobility. SpaceX is a uh, mission-driven company, like uh, populate Mars and, yeah. and beyond, okay? Yeah. Guess what? They have the best talent of the US in engineering going to these. Yeah. Best talent is not going for other companies. Yeah. So you have to build something exciting and demonstrate that you are helpful to society. Mm -hmm. Because in my experience, the very best people, the best talents, they don't come just for the money. Of course, they want to come and be a su big success that people are going to talk about, etc. You have to have that. But if you have that component of, I'm really doing something important, positive, good karma, and I'm not doing it for any sort of return or whatever, it, this is genuine. Well, it's going to create a much more interesting company and people will stay. Yeah, you may ask like what's a, a quick uh, tip on like how do you find uh, a mission or like a vision? Really simply, it could be like a formula. The word is X today, X. 
with my vision, the work is Y. And if you come up with your X and Y and it's bold, that uh, could be a proper vision. Like, uh, just the way. The bolder, the better. And the bolder, the better. Yeah. Like, the word is not connected today. With Facebook, the word is connected in one place. So you can simplify it that way. Like, it's a. Because I get asked all the time about this. So it's yeah, like, it's like a really. Like, course, building the digital AI uh, potential of Africa. Instead of building the AI capabilities and bridging the developing world with the developed world with a better future for AI. You see? Benefits mm. everyone. Mm. You, it has to be bold. Otherwise, the top talents, they don't want to come just because they think you, they're going to make money mm. with you. Uh. They will make money with anyone. They could work with any, for anyone. They want something special, which is exciting, and that fits what they want to do in life. Mm. You know, the bar is high, but if you stru structure it like this way, trust me, people mm. will come and you will never have a problem hiring top talents and keeping them. Mm. I mean, uh, go ahead. Yeah. You, st you, you will still you know all of this, and you, you still, still fight <laughs> to manage retention, and you will, still to, you will still have people leaving. And honestly, the best way is also to manage retention is like to accept retention, because we live in a, in a generation where, like, where uh, people actually leave companies really fast. Like, uh, it's not the same as our like, father's generation or like, People are like more comfortable in staying in companies two or three years, going to the second company. So it helps to accept it uh, mentally also. Can I ask so. just a sure. question? Here's a question, not only about the company, but we need the most of people. They find exciting, they just want to relocate to our offices, to board. No, the, 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 the relocation thing, uh, at InstaDeep, we, we, we basically have a policy now that if you are an employee in Tunis, uh, if you're doing a great job, after a certain number of years, you will be offered opportunities abroad. So it has to be, you have to take into account what the team wants, but it goes the other way. We also have talents in Europe that want to come to discover, you know, uh, our African offices. You know, again, this is not an easy uh, thing, and Yahya is right, but it can be managed if you are a super exciting company. And, you know, the last secret of retention is momentum. Yeah. A company that has extraordinary momentum will not lose its top talent. Because people sense when this is really exciting, when there's something happening, yeah. and they want to be part of it, you know. So if you're not sure, yeah. make, it, make it bold, make it exciting, make it fun, and move ultra fast. Yeah. You know, as we said, a good plan today, better than perfect plan, uh, you know, tomorrow or next week. Yeah. <laughs> Kerim, uh, I really want you to know that uh, it's a big honor for me to meet you physically. Uh, and this passion f for Ansteadip and for you been like, like since you had the speech at MIT and since I heard about the BioNTech funding and stuff. And this has really shocked me either when I, when I knew that uh, this is a Tunisian, like maybe half Tunisian, but it's a Tunisian like work, you know what I'm saying? And so I have two questions for you and two questions for Yahya. Uh, there's a point that I always that always made me uh, always made me how can I say uh, confused, mm -hmm. and it's which do I really need a engineering degree to be an AI engineer? Like, do I really need to <laughs> make an AI degree? in AI and data science and this circle to have what can the AI engineer does? Is it necessary or it only depends on uh, the coding skills and uh, the innovation in this field? And the question is, um, let's say I had a startup of AI, do I need to, to, to expand, to reach out all the fields like uh, AI solutions in sports, AI solutions uh, in art, AI solutions in mm -hmm. education, AI solutions in healthcare, AI solutions in wars. No, I'm joking. So, is it uh, or do I need to focus on one indu yes, yes. on one I industry? I understand the question. So, thank you. Maybe I'll answer these two and then you can ask Yahya his, yeah, two, yeah, yeah. his two questions. Is there two like uh, yeah. you know yeah. essay so, um, questions? So the first the first question about like what do you need? Technically speaking, if you are showing exceptional talent in AI, and you could see it through, for example, like your you know, code on GitHub that you, you built, things that, that are really remarkable, we, we don't care. 
where you come from. You could have zero diploma. If you showed proof of exceptional ability, we would hire you. Obviously, we're a deep tech uh, sort of like a dream team of AI. So the bar to entry is very high. But in principle, it's about a ability. So it happens some, from time to time that somebody comes with not the right background, but the right abilities, we take them. But most of the time, these are more like advanced type of profiles. Ultimately, it's about what you can do. It's not about the diploma. So that's how we hire. Yes, but I'm not talking in terms of giving a job or something. I'm speaking in just launching an AI startup or making an impact. Yeah, yeah. But first, like in terms of like, uh, can, do, can you have an impact, etc. AI is not an easy field. Yeah. It's that's not an I easy. Am. So if you're just thinking about like launching a general AI company in 2022, I think it would probably fail. And I don't want to dis sort of like uh, uh, make you less motivated. Mm -hmm. I will tell you what would probably succeed. And this answers your second question. What would succeed is exceptional competence in a given field. We talked about legal here. We talked about insurance. And combining that with AI. AI in general, you see like InstaDeep is an AI in general company. But we started in 2014, and now we have a lot of momentum, a lot of capabilities. That barrier to entry is very high today. But if you take a particular vertical where you have exceptional domain expertise, and you build your domain expertise in AI, okay. yes, then you're setting yourself up for success. That's my point of view. General AI today, the bar is extremely high. And what was possible like five, six, or eight years ago, is less possible today because there is a lot of progress. Competition. Yeah. So mm -hmm. these are my two advice. But it is possible. You train yourself, you build your capabilities, and you specialize on something on which you have unique competence. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's possible. Let me give you an idea of what could work. What could work would be to address a particular problem uh, using, for example, conversational AI a particular problem that you master very well. It could be legal, it could be uh, insurance, in a market where you don't have that. So the large markets, the US, Europe, they already have that. Tunisia or other large countries in Africa, maybe they do not have those conversational tools. This, there is a revolution going on in conversational AI today. This would potentially work if you know that specific field very well and if your AI is elite. By the way, we can help you. Uh, this is true for everyone. We have a, uh, an initiative where InstaDeep is offering free compute uh, of uh, our largest uh, supercomputers like DGX A100s. These are like very powerful machines. They cost like half a million dinars each. And we, if you have a project and you need machine learning, we just ask you that you already have a code that works and you know what you're doing, but we would give you the compute for free. So uh, this is a way also to support the ecosystem. So if you do it this way, I think, yes, you might be onto something. Mm. Clear, yeah. OK. OK. Uh, I think yes. we'll take two questions per person. To ask to take uh, the maximum from everyone. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then we will take one question online, and then we will share. Yeah. We'll take uh, other, like, let's say, four, maybe five questions, and yeah. we call to. Morning. Sorry. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your presence here and sharing with us uh, a such a precious moment. Uh, so I am Noessa Khani. I am a computer science uh, engineer. I have 13 years of experience now. I'm project manager since eight years in a software IT uh, project. Okay. So in fact, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, if you uh, have the chance to redo your experience or redo history, what are the decisions that you may change? Uh, I can start. Yeah, yeah, that project I had done before, trying to do something with regulation, I would never do again. Yeah, so that's for sure. So please go digital and go small footprint or zero footprint with government and regulation. Very important. That's number one. Number two, uh, on the Insta Deep story, to be honest, I wouldn't change many things because. It was a hard path, but somehow it was fulfilling at every stage. We were having fun in the bootstrap team of InstaDeep of the early days. It, it was fun, you know? And what we do now is also very fun, very impactful. 
So on the InstaDeep side, yes, perhaps I could have accelerated a few decisions. Perhaps we could have accelerated one of first AI product. Maybe perhaps we could have raised money faster. But really, I do not think there could be a potentially significantly larger scenario than what we are doing today. And that project succeeded because we put all our heart in it. And we worked very hard on something we were passionate about. And yeah, probably raising money a bit faster or things like that, but nothing really different. The first project changed everything. Never do anything non-digital or regulation heavy. So we advise to enjoy the process. You have to. Yeah. The only way to survive is you enjoy the process. I mean, ask, uh, uh, for example, uh, Elise, yeah, uh, like, it's years of hard work, or Yahya, it's years of hard work. If you're doing this for the money, you're going to get bored very quickly. And you're going to realize, like, let me put it this way. You know, we all talk about, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, the large fundraiser of InstaDeep, and the amazing fundraiser of GoMyCode. But what people don't talk about is years and years of pain, of doubt, yeah. of challenges. There is no get rich or get successful quick scheme. It does not exist. And entrepreneurship is actually being successful the hard way. The easy way or the relatively easier way, join a team that is already on a rocket ship trajectory. Then you can be very successful very quickly at relatively low risk. Like join GoMyCo, join InstaDeep. That's from a risk reward, probably the optimal risk reward. Never join a normal business because it's not exponential. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, that's the hard way. Really, that is the hard way. Like, you better, much better be part of an early stage company that is showing some traction, not super early stage, like showing some traction. Like today, Go My Code has amazing traction, and it is at Series A. And I'm personally convinced, Yahya, people like him, they are the future of Tunisia. Like, they will be wildly successful if they keep up with the same passion, spirit, etc. But entrepreneur, don't do it if you think, hey, it's happening and people are like doing all these crazy things. That is in part an illusion because it, it's, it's the survivorship bias, yeah? It's like Hollywood, yeah? You know, we all watch the movies and stuff, Hollywood. It's like, oh, you know, in, back in the days in the US, like people say, oh, I'm gonna go to Hollywood and become a, a star like Brad Pitt. Well, it's a bad choice because Brad Pitt is the exception, the guy who was successful, and there are a thousand people applied and they were good looking and they looked cool, and then and they failed. So don't look at the success uh, to make a decision on entrepreneur or not. So coming back, it has to come from inside. It has to be passion. If it is passion, it can be sustained. Yeah, at, at different points in the life of the project, it's probably true for you. I actually didn't care if we would be fail or not, like, meaning that I did everything I could that we are successful. But even failure for me, like given what we are doing and the interest, I considered it a personal success. Like I did stuff which I really cared about. You have that mindset and you're fighting super hard for survive, you have a chance, but it will take years. Totally agree with Karima. Uh, you know, I started like as a summer project. It was a summer project. It was a hobby. It was a summer, a hobby, a summer project, and I was planning to go back next year to university. And after the summer project, I was like, it's gonna be a gap year. It's not gonna be even like a company, a gap year project. And ended up working on a company, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. So uh, the second question. important impacts and how we how was the mitigation that you use it okay so uh, a big risk for me like no. b2b business <coughs> and that's the question of b2b the biggest mm. risk you do as a b2b business is that mm. you have to invest a lot of effort and time to convince a client to become to convert and become actually paying you revenues uh, i have a few examples <laughs> one big client which we didn't get by the way we took literally, and some of the people in this room know what I'm talking about. We worked hard for 18 months. We built an amazing proof of concept product. Mm. And we did all this effort for nothing. It didn't work in the end. Some people left that big company which were going to do it with us, and so it didn't happen. However, it was a learning process, and the tools we used, we used in other situations, etc. So as a B2B, the biggest risk you have is you invest massively into 
one customer or one relationship to get it to fruition, it could, it could be more than a year sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it could fail. And some cases it failed and we were like, this is insane. We did everything right. We have a product that works and just mm -hmm. the people left, things changed and that big company decided not to go ahead. Sure. The mitigation is you diversify. If you do this over multiple high quality partners, some of them will actually work with you. And if they work with you, then it grows, etc. And this is what yeah. happened with the partners you know. So that's yeah. my personal feedback on B2B. Yeah. B2B, you have to be really, really patient. Yeah. Uh, well, I have, there is like a trillion risk that I can think of building a company, but maybe to correlate it with GoMyCode specifically, one of the biggest risks that been there at every single step is in the GoMyCode module, you have a lot of atoms versus like bits, you know, versus physical presence. Yeah. You have a lot of atoms, like you have literally physical spaces and you have more human to train more humans, you need more humans. So the it makes it really, really risky to grow and to manage, you know. Like I said, to train ten students you need one teacher. To train more students you need more square meters. As like you need more chairs. So that can make it really, really risky to grow, to manage the cash flow with uh, the scale, it's very complicated to scale and it's very, very also complicated to manage the experience of the students uh, because it's, it's not 100% like, you know, uh, tech uh, oriented. It's like led by humans. And with humans, there is higher probability of risk, you know. We have 5,000 students, anything could happen at like, you know, it's, it's really not easy to manage 5,000 students between 20 spaces. Um, so that's a big, big risk in, uh, in the GoMyCode model that we actually use technology and we use specifically graph technology to manage, to mitigate this risk a bit, which is a technology usually used in like uh, banks and like with fraud detection, you'd like detect fraud in the graph, at the layer of the graph, but we use it at the layer of the skill so we can know how like the students or teachers progressing at the layer of the node and the skill and the... So we, we had to come up with a lot of solutions I mean, KPI is, is way, but you need to also build a, a lot of tech to manage uh, the, 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 to optimize your chances to have less risk, you know. But that's a big major thing about GoMyCode, code, which is like, you actually need to grow, you need more atoms in the model that you're trying to also uh, problem solve as we grow, you know. Um, that's like the biggest risk I think we, we, find we have in our model, and it's been there at every single step with investors, with the students, with the teachers, you know. Um, but we're trying to solve, you know. But we also try to, um, to, to optimize what's really good about having spaces and what's really good about having teachers in the model. And, you know. Um, Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, we actually have two questions online. Uh, the first one is for you both. Uh, when do you know you are ready to, to go for international expansion? I mean, I think you, you, you don't necessarily know. Like, I would say, like, you don't. Because, you know, it's, 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 a, it's two things. It's a, it's a decision making that you need, it's a decision making framework that you like. You need to be utterly convinced that you can and take the decision to grow. You know, it's a really like a, decision that you need to take. The second thing, it's really, it's the product. Uh, uh, you know, GoMyCode, we spent the first three years building, just building the product in Tunisia. Like before opening any other countries, we have to open different location within the same countries. So we opened Tunis, but after we expanded to Sousse and Sfeqas, and we spent two years trying to manage Sousse and Sfeqas because the complexity went from 10 to 100. Yeah, you know, and specifically in education, it's very, very easy to do education for like small cohorts of students. It's very easy to run a cohort with 20 students. And you have a lot of schools doing this. But once you go from 20 to 100 to beyond, the complexity gets not two times or three times, gets 100 times. Uh, so we, it helps to spend a lot of time building, structuring the product. It's only when we had something solid working in Tunisia and we started seeing like good NPS and good completion rates and good you know, metrics and all, then we started, okay, we have this product, we have this technology, we had this user retention, we had this NPS. Okay, it makes sense to expand in other countries. So it helps to have like some maturity into the product. In our case, for example, um, yeah, uh, this is the key thing I would say. Uh, it helps to have some sense of playbook. Uh, like, for example, for us, like, 
how do acquire how do we acquire students do we have a model for acquiring students like or like how do we hire teachers do we have a model for hiring teachers so it actually ha it helps to have some sense of models that you try it, develop it, and you have accuracy on those models. For example, for us, we only opened new country once we had the product running. Once we had the model kind of figure out, like, how do we hire teacher? We had also the model of, like, how do we acquire students? And the expansion work was mostly replication. It was not innovation. It was operation. The expansion was purely operational work and nothing to do with the product or nothing to do with the innovation aspect. So I'd say expansion, specifically in B2C businesses, are about operational capacity and less about product innovation. So I would say like my best advice is like spend the first two years or like year, depending on the business, doing product innovation, product innovation, product innovation. Once you have good product with good metrics, okay, operational excellence. Okay, replicate this in multiple locations and spaces. So I don't know. Yeah, no, I totally agree with Yahya. Yeah. Key thing also is keep in mind that you need to design your project that it has an international potential from day one. Sure. And yes, you're going to iterate in one country, essentially get to product market fit, where you see this is working, you're getting revenues, people are re-engaging with you. And, and then you're perhaps ready to go international when you feel actually clients would benefit from this or you can reach out more clients. But you, as Yahya said, you need to have something already going well. So spend the time to iterate it's locally is good, but don't get, don't design your project in a way that it is stuck locally. This is very critical. Project needs to have international ambition. You talked about mission from day one. <coughs> then you iterate locally until it works, and then you prudently open a first office. If it works again, that you can be a lot more aggressive. That's when. We went to London first, and then very quickly we went all over Africa, Cape Town, Lagos, Nigeria, etc. So when you feel this is working, then you can go all in, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. basically. Something really exciting about what you do also, and specifically about Tunisia, you would think that a country like Senegal would be very different from Tunisia. It's not. We have the same problems, same issues, same challenges. It's exactly the same. The, same multiple, the multiple is different. Like maybe. Algeria is like three times, four times bigger, but same challenges. So your Tunisian model can, easier, can easily work in Algeria, you know, specifically for our case. And it couldn't work necessarily in Europe, for example. But since in these countries where we operate, we have high unemployment rates, we have lack of physical infrastructure, we have uh, highly educated employed youth, like we have the same, you know, patterns in these countries. So what worked, what worked in Tunisia, will potentially work, I would say, in countries around, like Algeria, Morocco, Côte d'Ivoire, Senegal, you know. Um, mm. And uh, the second question is for you. So as someone outsider of the tech field with an English diploma, uh, where can I start to switch career to AI, and how long would it take me to acquire the needed skills? OK, well, the answer is simple. Go to go, my code. <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, yeah. like, I'm really excited about yeah. what you guys are building, to be honest, because a big challenge is not whether Africans and Tunisians will have jobs. You will have jobs. Why? Because a big part of the developed world is not renewing its population yeah. and is growing older. So you're going to need people to do the, the jobs. The robots are not going to do anything. Yeah. You know? So the question is more, are these jobs going to be high quality, skilled jobs or low quality, low paid, low skilled? And the answer is, part of the answer is actually developing your tech skills. And I think the Go My Code model is extraordinarily powerful and relevant there. And so that's the step one of your evolution to become an AI engineer, is learn the basics at Go My Code. Once you have the basics, you know how GitHub works, etc. start to learn directly from the internet, etc. But my personal belief is, you cannot learn from the internet alone. It's very difficult because there is just too much. And it's the problem of where do you find the right relevant information. It's like how to filter. And this is why, actually, the model of Go My Code with one teacher for 10 students is so powerful. Because these are people helping you know what is relevant. And once you start knowing what works and what doesn't, you continue to learn from good sources. And ultimately, you can make your way into becoming an elite AI engineer. But yes.
that's go my code is yeah, the yeah. key step. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Fatma Mani. I'm a reporter. I uh, have uh, two questions, uh, one for Yahya and one for Kareem. Uh, first, I want to thank you for uh, your positive message. I, I uh, think that uh, the most important uh, message is uh, believe in yourself and think big. Uh, so my question for Yahya is, uh, in Tunisia, we have uh, a culture of fear, fear of failure. Uh, so when you're a young person, how can you believe in yourself and not uh, listen to the noise? And uh, my question for Karim, uh, uh, Stajib uh, is uh, founded in Tunisia, but, uh, but uh, is uh, a London-based uh, company. So uh, was it uh, easier, uh, uh, was it easier uh, legally uh, to, to base the company uh, in London? Yeah. yeah, I mean, the fear question is like, um, I mean, there is a lot of uh, answers for this, right? It's not an easy, uh, you're always going to have fear in any way, right? But maybe the best answer for this is you need to get some sort of uh, user validation. As like, once you have some users who actually believe in your product or in your service, that's really a good validation for you to double down and work more on this and reduce that fear uh, span that you have. And the more validation you get from users and the more trust you get from your clients, you probably build better capacity to manage uh, the fear to fail and, uh, you know. Um, um, but I think it's really important in our countries to have a winning mindset also, which is something we, we always think too much about, like, failing, but it actually helps to have a winner mindset and, like, always have a really good positive... Uh, you know, like, what I learned is that even if things really go crazy, like it's going chaotic, I'd have a really positive uh, attitude and mindset about this. And I would be very receptive, uh, you know, which is something you, you don't learn the, 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 at the very early stage. Like if something is going crazy, I would like really go like, you know, but I learned like it doesn't matter to, be, to, to get fear or to um, fear of failure. What matters is actually the decision that you take and the, the decision making that you, you, you're doing. I think it's important to have this winning mindset is like, we're gonna find a way to do it, we're gonna solve it, uh, we're gonna get there, it's gonna be ugly and hard, but we're gonna do it. It's really like a mindset mentality thing that we should build. Um, so I'd say it's a mindset and it's a, it's a, it's a big, big, big validation uh, from users. So, like it would never grow if we, didn't have the very first students telling us that our service is good and giving us feedback on what to improve and iterate and you know. So I don't know, this is my advice, but like there is a million. Uh, In a sense, all this event yeah. is about having the positive energy and the willingness to take risks. Yeah. And this is what is changing the ecosystem for, for, for the better. And I think like, if you're considering doing like uh, potentially risky stuff, there is no better moment to do it than when you're young, sure. because it doesn't matter. Like the, the fear of failure actually grows through time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I used to work in a regular uh, company, and uh, when I left, I left a senior position. Mm -hmm. All my friends said, you are crazy to do this. It will, never, it will fail. Except I actually had a lot of negative pressure from my peers. No, they all want to work for InstaDeep, you know? So that's the, the funny thing. But so believe in yourself, be positive, because it's about the journey as much as it is about the, the result. If you enjoy the journey and have a feeling you're doing exactly anything you can and you're doing things that you love, you're competent, etc., somehow, you know, the result will end up more likely than not pretty good. But it's about the journey, uh, in a sense. And so, uh, and, and so, yeah, so uh, I don't know what you wanted to, uh, second, no. question. second question. Second question is, uh, well, InstaDeep was founded in Tunisia. Ah, yes, about, yeah. Like yeah. yeah, obviously, you know, the UK is, uh, is a very sort of like pro-business uh, environment, very easy. I remember setting up InstaDeep in the UK in one afternoon online. It was super fast. Uh, it's easier to raise money from investors and the like. So definitely, you know, there's still no comparison. However, I believe Tunisia is on the right path. Startup Act did help a lot already. And the key thing is we need to have big successes in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Tunisia such that the government sees that, hey, this is actually working. I'll give you an example. 
InstaDeep was uh, part of the Startup Act. Now we are beyond it. And now, so we'll be paying a lot of like social charges on employees, etc. But because we have accelerated and we're a big business, we're very happy to pay your taxes, you know? And so that's from the point of view of society and the government, this is actually a success. Now you have a large player who's actually contributing a lot of tax. And so I think Tunisia and the government, there is a, a good sense. They start to understand really well the potential of the ecosystem. But it is up to us to prove that potential and, and make it happen and somehow uh, justify their trust in us. You know, that's the way I would put it. So there is a gap, but I don't think it's an issue to create a startup in Tunisia anymore. And yeah. you definitely have to share your journey. Mm. Like, like, we, like we started in Tunisia and then we incorporated in London. You, you guys did a different path, but a bit similar. So yeah. we, we will communicate more about how yeah. to do this. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Last one, last question. Yes, yeah. last question. Uh, thank you both for this uh, amazing uh, talk. Uh, very interesting. I'm uh, Fadi Qasim. I'm um, a university professor in com computer science. I recently went into a new uh, adventure, founding a new high-tech company in AI for uh, e-health, where we're trying to prototype some um, machi affordable machines for... Um, or to a self-diagnosis uh, and stuff like this. Uh, well, uh, I'm trying to, uh, with my colleagues who are re researchers, I'm trying to uh, hack uh, their mindset in order to uh, not uh, be interested only in um, publishing, but also in ma uh, doing practical things uh, that can be uh, helpful for people. Uh, so, uh, Karim, would you... Uh, give me some hints about how to interest researchers uh, in order to um, uh, do uh, projects with uh, companies and startups. And my second question is, as I'm trying to be inclusive, I know that uh, there, uh, there start to be a lot of uh, e-health companies in, um, in Tunisia. So I'm wondering about uh, um, strategies, how to uh, establish a long-term um, uh, partnership between um, companies with the same um, uh, or uh, offering the same uh, products or services. Thank you. So, uh, th thanks for the question. So uh, uh, basically, like, how do you interest uh, researchers into getting their hands dirty and doing stuff? Well, it's by you do it first, essentially. It's like. If you want to convince some of your team members that something should be done and you feel maybe they're not convinced, do it and show that it is worth it and potentially that it is fun. So at InstaDeep, we have elite researchers. We have really like some of the smartest minds in Africa and, and beyond. I, we never force them into going to do a client project. We want them to be interested. We show them, hey, we did all these things, you know, like writing papers and stuff. But you could also like, use that and have an impact. And they tend to like that. And likewise, we let our engineering team potentially uh, participate into research papers. If someone really wants to say, look, I really want to work on research, do this and that, we'll make it happen. So it's about you show, you lead by example, and you show it's fun. And then ultimately, you know, they will get interested in this. But yes, I mean, uh, AI and health, there is a lot going on. It's a very interesting field. It's also a heavily regulated field. And so this is an area also where you need to be careful about what's possible and not, and not get slowed down. The general theme of health and AI is very interesting. Just make sure you minimize, as we said, the regulatory footprint. And engaging with other companies, et cetera, it should really be about like how together we push the ecosystem. We ensure new best practices of collaboration and, and the like. And we push everybody up, essentially. As we said, it's about enlarging the pie and doing things that will inspire others. It's a little bit the same spirit we have, Yahya and I, and this is why we organized this event, is to really explaining that collaboration can help, but be very focused about what you're trying to do and try to minimize the regulatory footprint. Yeah. Well, um, I think we are we're go beyond three hours, so I'm going to close this from here. Yes, so uh, thank you so much for, uh, for yeah. making it to this event. Yeah. Uh, it was really good to have you, and hopefully we're going to try to throw more events like this. 
and yeah, I hope it was really resourceful and like really inspiring for you. And uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're gonna have a picture, a group picture. Yeah. So, okay. Feel free to come. We're gonna have a group picture. Uh, Oops. Three hours. Scana. Voilà.